Yo, hello, hello. Welcome to a new video from the elephant in the room. My name is Aaron and in today's video we will continue with the chapter Systems to Organize Societies from the book The Money Game and Beyond. All right, so welcome back to a new video. It's been a while since the last video because I was quite busy with a lot of things, but I'm now super excited to go back to the book. And this is going to be the last video of the second chapter of the chapter Systems to Organize Societies. So I would just say, let's jump right into it, but maybe let's first recap um, what we discussed in the last video. Um, for example, we have um, talked about the advantages of the gift and sharing economy and um, you know this is a, an approach that has a lot of advantages and that just proves how people can work together from all around the world and create something which is remarkable super powerful super useful and also secure and reliable like the first point since everything is open source, everybody can see like this program or this application has some trackers in it or some viruses or some bad other things. Um, so yeah, just make it open source so that the source code is freely available. Um, the second point is that it creates a huge diversity. Like since if everything is free and open source, freely available, you can just take it and create your own version of it. And this is something that happened in the Linux world, like in the open source software world, where we can see not only like Windows or Mac OS, but we can see hundreds or even thousands of operating systems. Um, and you can just pick whatever you like and you can use whatever you like. And I'm using here, for example, Tromjaro. Like this is a Linux operating system based on Manjaro Linux. Um, and yeah, I won't touch uh, Windows or Mac OS anymore. <laughs> I'm just using Linux. Um, the same with also uh, 3D printing designs. Like so many people develop um, 3D printing designs and you can just take them, use them, customize them and publish them again and share them again. So I think it's just super cool. The next point is about cooperation and education. And I think this also just makes sense, right? Because um, if you have something that is freely available and you can use it, you can customize it, that's how you learn how to use it. That's how you learn how to, maybe you will see, okay, we can improve this or we can improve that. This is also the next point with efficiency. It just makes sense to like uh, use something that others created and then um, improve it instead of building it from scratch. Of course you can do that, but that's much more work, right? So instead of each company developing uh, their own kind of thing, let's just make everything open source and freely available and people just improve it continually and make it better in time. Um, and I think that's just how it should be. And that's also become the standard kind of what I've experienced in, for example, server management, for example. I've read that I think pretty much every supercomputer on this world is just running on Linux because it's so customizable, it's so fast, it's so reliable. And um, yeah, it just has become the standard. And I've also seen that or I've heard from people that the approach of the open source approach is just the standard also in developing uh, for industrial purposes some software or some other things so it just makes sense to do that because of its also efficiency um, another example that I want to um, just showcase as an example is NixOS you know I've been here in Dresden in the hackerspace there are many hackerspaces all around the world in pretty much every big city 
And these guys, they are working on NixOS and NixOS is also a Linux operating system. And the unique thing about it is that it is reproducible and declarative. I'm also just kind of getting started with NixOS, but it seems very promising. And um, there are so many, like thousands of packages um, for NixOS. And if you're a bit more advanced, if you're a bit more experienced, you can check it out, you can just download it. Um, and yeah, also help the project to grow, to improve it. There's a huge community. Um, and to me, this is just also another great example how people can work together from all around the world and create something um, that is super useful. And with that in mind, so we have now this amazing approach of the sharing and gift economy. Um, we also should not forget about the bigger picture because, you know, these tools like NixOS, Linux operating systems, these are amazing tools. But we are going to learn that in today's world, that in today's trade structure, like our, our society that is based on trades, these tools get also a bit muddied, um, you could say. So let's explore that a little bit further. So one example um, that is showcased here is the Tor browser. The Tor browser is making browsing private. So instead of you just connecting with the server directly and accessing a website, for example, um, the traffic is going through different um, computers, basically different um, access points so that it's very hard to track you back, that it's very difficult to realize, okay, you are going to check out or you're browsing this website. Um, you can read more about the Tor browser, probably you, you've heard about the Tor browser. Um, and it is also a very cool tool because it allows a journalist, for example, that lives in a state where the government is very suppressive, like um, China, for example, China is suppressing some major minorities um, and you can just write about that. And the Tor browser is a tool that allows you to do that because it hides your identity, basically. But at the same time, you can use the Tor browser to buy weapons or buy some credit card details from people or some tracking tools or whatever bad things. So. The point here is that whatever technology we are going to develop, that we are going to invent, it's always a matter of how we are using this technology. And we can use it for good purposes, but we can also use it for bad purposes. And in today's society, many tools are used for bad purposes because we always have to keep in mind the profit incentive of today's society. Another example is the peer-to-peer -peer network, kind of. Um, you can also read more about BitTorrent here. So the idea is, instead of you relying on one server to download a video, for example, um, you are going to download many pieces of that video from different sources, from different computers or different servers. And um, yeah, these are also called peers and each peer stores some pieces of that video, of that file, of that whatever, and um, you are going to download it from them. So the one great thing is that it is very difficult to shut it down because you cannot shut it down unless you shut down basically the whole network. And um, this is actually the point that like some companies try to do. They try to sue people um, because they shared some movies there. So think about that. People in today's world, they are very interested in the latest Hollywood movie. Um, they want to see Iron Man. They want to watch um, all these Marvel adventures um, videos, the Spider-Man or whatever, some Netflix series. Um, and instead of going into the cinema and just paying there, they are sharing it on that peer-to-peer -peer network. So Hollywood movies, they try to um, sue them and to stop them from doing that. 
For example, there is one hub which is called the Pyro Bay that is basically a website that made it possible for tons of torrent files, that's how they are called, to be uploaded, sorted and downloaded at will, allowing it to emerge as a leader in file sharing for many years. The issue with it, since technology reflects mainly people's values, humans mainly use this website to share closed source, non-free movies, music and pieces of software between them. As a result, the Pirate Bay quickly became associated with online piracy. So, of course, like the Hollywood movie company, they tried to um, sue the Pirate Bay, they tried to bring it down so that people are not able anymore to access these um, movies. But what happened then is that the Pirate Bay came back to life because people were just motivated to yeah, keep the website running. And we can like get two points from that story. One is, as long as people are motivated to do something, they will do it. No matter if there are any laws, if they are not allowed to do that, if some people say, stop with it, they don't give a shit, they just do it. And the second thing is culture. Remember that like people were sharing Hollywood movies over that peer-to-peer -peer, um, network? Why do they share a fucking retarded Hollywood movie instead of a documentary? This is to me, you know, because we are growing up in this world, we get to learn and be amazed by these Hollywood movies, by Spider-Man, Batman, the Avengers or however they are called. But we completely forget that we live in this amazing reality. We are made out of atoms. Like you and I, we are made of atoms and the whole galaxy is made out of atoms. And we are floating somehow in space in this vast universe. And just think about um, medicine, think about biology, think about nanoscience. You know, there are so many things that are just mesmerizing and we cannot grasp them or it is very difficult to grasp them. So we should be amazed by that and not by a fucking Hollywood movie. But let's get back to the culture. Whatever sells best, sells best. And that's why these companies are pushing this um, always repeating Hollywood movies, the same story over and over and over again because it's just for profit. So, we are not putting down such technologies as they are fabulous, are super useful and are bringing a lot of progress. But we need to point out that these tools are integrated into or heavily influenced by the trade system and culture that has evolved around it. Or also just think about the gaming culture, you know, so many people play, I don't know, Minecraft or World of Warcraft or Call of Duty or whatever shooting game. Think about, we play some games about solving cancer. Think about some games where we learn about protein folding or our um, cells in our body or about the heart or about our brain, the nervous system. Isn't that, you know, just think about the real world and you will find so many astonishing things. All right, so 3D printers can be used to print functional guns or encouraging the ever-growing consumption of plastics and other materials as people try to make businesses out of the technology. Open source software can be directed towards profit-based projects such as making Linux compatible only with certain devices due to contract terms they have with some manufacturers. For instance, 80% of Linux kernel contributors are now paid and working for various companies. Android, even if it's based on open source software, pushes Google's products because it is still owned and supported by Google. Yeah, so I just got my phone because I want to show you. I have an Android phone and you can see that it comes with Google Maps, Google Mail, Google Drive, Google Photos, Google Chrome, YouTube. And all these applications I cannot deinstall from this device. It is impossible. Google made these apps inherent to the system. So what Google did is basically they took the hard work of all these developers, um, it took the Android project and inserted their own customized apps and then just shipped it with every phone that is basically produced. And um, yeah, it's, it's impossible for people to get rid of Google. 
unless they deinstall um, the whole operating system and install a new one. But some people or the majority of people is probably not able to do that or also not motivated to do that. So yes, that's why Google has such a power and it's so difficult to fight against such a huge company. Um, and with that power they are also abusing it. They are, for example, restricting some um, ad blocking apps, for example, which cannot get approval to be added to the Android store, although they help users to get rid of intrusive ads and secure the device against tracking scripts used by various ads, all because Google decided that didn't fit in with the larger profit motive goals of the system. And yes, because it is open source, you can uninstall Android and install a different version that suits you, basically unlock it, but very few are aware of this option or are skilled enough to do it. It's also quite revealing that even if, let's say, a search engine is open source and peer-to-peer, -peer, as it becomes popular and many people are using it, the people who control this search engine can then put rules in place to serve their own interests. And they can do that because of its popularity and encouragement by the monetary system or by the trade system. And there's one funny example that uh, was revealed just a couple uh, days ago, actually. Yeah, so this is the article, DuckDuckGo isn't as private as you thought. Because I think in the article they are saying that DuckDuckGo has some deals with Microsoft um, so they are advertising themselves as this private search engine. They only have ads, but they don't track what you search. But somehow, you know, um, it's not really like that. And they have some shady deals in the background. Um, and this is why you cannot trust basically any company, because there's always the slippery slope of trades that will push a company to lie as DuckDuckGo did or to, yeah, to, you know, just cheat, to not pay taxes or whatever bad things companies do. So yeah, the main point here is to always keep in mind that whatever technology we develop or um, invent, we should always watch out for the culture if it's abused or if it's raped by the culture. Um, which in case is happening, um, like what is Google doing to Android, you can also consider that as so evil. And Google's motto was in the beginning, don't be evil. So yeah, what can you say now? So all in all, no matter how interesting and potentially progressive a piece of technology is, it will always reflect the culture and the system that is part of. While thinking that these open source technologies will eventually overtake their proprietary counterparts may be true in some cases after a long period of struggle, but as exemplified, they too become polluted by the money game or by the trade game, even if that happens. Like here it's saying that, you know, Linux is, as we discussed, so reliable, so secure, so um, efficient, but how many people are using it? And then we can figure out that 1.5% of desktop users are running Linux. This was in 2015, but I still think that probably less than 2 or 3% of um, computer users are running on, are, are using Linux. Um, so it's also a matter of education, you know, we should educate people about why proprietary software is bad, why you should use Linux, why it's better, why you should also contribute to it because, you know, you're not helping yourself but also other people who are using it. Now, that being said, let's debunk some myths, starting with the myth that technology is going to save us to change society, to lead us to a world of abundance, equality and security. The illusion that science and technology will create the best society. Both technocracy and now the modern open source and decentralized movement spin around the idea that technology is the key to creating a better society, to solving today's problems. And there are many people who think like that, who believe that and who say that, yeah, technology is going to solve all our problems. Um, 
If that would be the case, we would have no problems anymore because we have all the technology, we have all the scientific knowledge um, to like provide for everyone to solve most of today's problems. You know, we live on a planet that is consisting like out of 70% of water. Of course, a lot of it is salt water, but we can use technology to um, desalinate it. But then it's always in, in, in the trade world, it's always the question, okay, how much does it cost? It's always about cost efficiency instead of technical efficiency. And um, yeah, so this is one great point. Um, and here's another example. The printing press was invented some 600 years ago, allowing people to quickly print many books and share their ideas with the world. This was a huge thing back then. Just think about the fact that before this invention, they could only copy books by hand. It was like moving from paintings to photos. Many people of that time were sure that this marvelous technology would bring peace on earth since they could now educate all of the world's people. And later on, the telegraph, radio, airplanes, TV, satellites and the internet were all considered to be tools that would bring people together, unite humans of all colors and ages and would create abundance. The reality, however, was that people indeed wrote books on science and educated others, improved communication and brought the world closer, but we also got many nonsensical books that transformed people into fanatics and dangerous or moronic creatures, planes used to better destroy entire cities, communication devices to spy, and other tools to kill, coerce, enslave and exploit. Wars got better because of these tools and the ugliness of the human animal has grown even greater as billions are still starving today while the world is possessing huge technological potential that could quickly solve these issues. And I'm just thinking about the war that is happening in the Ukraine, you know? We have so many companies working on better weapons, how to better kill other people. Isn't that completely backwards? Shouldn't we walk on something that is going to help other people, that improves their living standard, that is going to automate boring and unnecessary and dangerous work? But no, like people are working on weapons, on how to build better tanks, on how to build better drones to um, kill other people. And so, um, yeah, we really should be careful about thinking that science and technology is going to solve all the problems and create the best society. It's always a matter of how we are going to use science and technology. There is absolutely no doubt that with today's technologies and scientific knowledge, we could cure most diseases, feed all people, provide for all of their necessities for free and overall solve all or most of the world's problems while at the same time satisfying all or most of people's needs and saner wants. But the issue is not with having the technological and scientific means. Let's explore that further. So, and now we are going to discuss some interesting projects um, from yeah, the beginning of the 20th century. Um, metabolism was one of these projects or movements. Um, it was inspired by um, like the technocratic movement, you could say. Um, it formed in or it developed in Japan and um, they thought about structures like houses, buildings and entire cities as uh, flexible, adaptable, organic and growing things um, that will change in time. So they knew that like people are changing, society is changing, so we should also develop an environment that is changing to adapt to that change. Um, they recognized that infrastructure must be designed with change in mind for it to adapt to people's needs alongside advancements in technology. Architects build conceptual models and even a few functional real size ones all toward solving the most pressing problems of their day, like population growth, resource management, etc. They developed, um, for example, these kinds of 
Yeah, buildings which are consisting out of many apartments and you can attach and detach them to this structure um, so it can change in time. So yeah, basically the tower was a vertical artificial land onto which steel prefabricated dwelling capsules could be attached. They proposed that these capsules would undergo self-renewal every 50 years and the city would grow organically, like branches of a tree. So they were inspired by nature and thought about these things to change, to adapt. And they also had a marine city in mind, like they developed these kinds of designs, um, thinking about living on the ocean long term also. Um, and they also had other plans for an agricultural city or Tokyo Bay plan for housing over 10 million people. And um, yeah, they also built, for example, the Nakagin capsule tower, uh, which was a, or is a very efficient building in theory with the ability to dynamically add additional capsules, like you can attach um, additional apartments but there are also some problems to this building like for example if you want to remove like the capsule at the bottom you would need to remove all the capsules above that so yes it was maybe also um, not the perfect design um, but that could be improved of course it could made uh, it could be made different and also with today's technology of course um, but its failure that's the point here seemed to have nothing to do with such issues similar to the case with free and open source software and hardware just because something is well designed useful and good does not guarantee its success in the trade world due to lack of funding Nakagin capsule tower is slowly degrading and will likely be demolished soon. So, in a way, metabolism was a form of technocracy that was applied briefly, but only from an architectural perspective. They still envisioned money, politics and such. While they had some detailed plans for sustainable cities and building architecture, and they tried to put some of them into practice, it never took off. As a side note, many of their members were influenced by the writings of Karl Marx. And you can watch this video to learn more about that movement. And to me, honestly, it's like I've never heard about metabolism. Um, and when I first read that book, I was like, wow, there have been like a lot of people thinking about that and maybe, yeah, wanting to have a society which is changing and the infrastructure to adapt instead of keeping things as they are because they have been like that for a long period of time. The same with Project Cybersyn, which was around 1972 in Chile actually. I would have loved to see how that project would be today, for example. Because the idea was that um, you would not rely on politics, on politicians who have no fucking idea what they are doing, who have no idea about science, about human behavior, about how to build buildings, about how to efficiently grow something, um, but are just like talking heads basically. Um, and that was their mindset um, in Chile. They um, were implying no more dictators or technicians with limited abilities. Um, they would rather rely on computers to make decisions or to help arrive at decisions. So, although the technology back then was rudimentary, they managed to build a nationwide network to monitor industries, resources, production, distribution. All of the data was fed into a central computer where scientists and economists were able to take more educated decisions based on it because now they had direct information about how their production and distribution facilities worked. As an example, 50,000 striking truck drivers blocked major streets and access passes across the country. So they basically blocked the whole roads. Um, but based on the data they got from this network, the government still managed to supply food to their citizens with only 200 trucks by knowing what roads to use, where to deliver, etc. 
the system they created worked great in this case. And that's just an example with how little energy we can like manage something very complex and yeah provide for people as well. The system they envisioned was based on the human nervous system because they thought of it as a dynamic reactive system that constantly adapts what is needed and where. And just think about our body, it's so efficient. Like one thing is that you can eat some pasta, you can eat some bananas, some vegetables, some fruits, some meat, some bread, and then you can do what? You can walk for hundreds or even thousands of kilometers. You can sprint, you can uh, swim for long distances if you're trained. So that's one inspirational point. And the other is how we can distribute that, like how our body is doing that. Like it delivers the energy to all the muscles where they are needed and does that in a very sophisticated way, I'd say. So in a way it was decentralized by relying on external nodes outside the network to feed it with data for arriving at decisions. But in another way, it was centralized because people in the control room still made decisions that influenced the overall network as well as the economy. They were, again, like other groups, proposing science in place of government. And while they actually succeeded in putting it in place, the project ended in 1973 following a revolution. Once the new government was installed, the network project was discontinued. And that's a shame because think about that. Think about how Chile could look like. I mean, I know that there is also a lot of poverty. There is a lot of inequality, but you have that all around the world. And if we would have started to like see how, how that project would evolve and how it would develop and how it would maybe also be very like way more efficient and way more um, and just better in terms of how we are distributing resources and production. Um, but yeah, we still have the trade economics going on and they are just um, destroying so many lives, so many people, the environment and um, yeah, <laughs> causing a lot of problems. Um, Buckminster Fuller, also a very inspirational guy. Uh, I won't go into that uh, right now, I'd say. You can read more about it. He developed these uh, geodesic domes and thought also about some technological um, solutions that they would revolutionize the world. Um, his motto was, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And I would say this is a very interesting quote. Um, and I know that he also developed the world game. I think it's called world game, where you can uh, learn about the world and how to, yeah, basically organize a civilization, how you um, efficiently produce and distribute goods and services. So um, a very interesting mind and um, he has some interesting designs and structures developed. So as we've showcased numerous examples here, many have tried this and failed. In each case, it was not a technological failure, but rather one of not fitting within a system and culture that is driven by money. Many millions were aware of these ideas, but in vain. This clearly shows that having a well-designed technological plan to make this world a better place without problems and to create abundance does not guarantee that it will work, not even when you experiment with it to prove that it works. The trade game is very powerful and too integrated in every culture and tribe. For a perfect example, look at climate change and there is humongous amount of evidence that climate change is created by human activities, mainly profit driven. Just think about all the fossil fuel companies that make enormous amounts of profits. Also now um, because of the um, 
war in Ukraine. <laughs> it's insane. Like these companies, the big oil companies, they are making billions, if not trillions of dollars right now uh, because of the, um, the prices and they go up and they can charge more. And then the German government is trying to lower the prices at the gas station. Uh, but then all that money is flowing into these oil companies. <laughs> so yeah, it's just, it's, it's so ridiculous. And that there are numerous technological solutions for solving it, but is that happening? So are these plans, which are based on science and technology toward reversing and dealing with climate change, perhaps the biggest issue right now for all of Earth's creature and backed up by the entire world of science being implemented just because they are 100% factual and feasible? Hmm, no. Then what makes you think that even if it's backed up by all the scientists around the globe presenting a detailed plan to improve our worldwide society will be enough to implement it? There are thousands of ideas, blueprints and designs of all sorts of cities and buildings that are clean, self-sustainable and so on. There is no shortage of these. And one such example is the Venus project. Um, they claim to even have the, the blueprints for many of such similar designs and ideas put forward by groups like Metabolism, Technocracy, Bucky Fuller and so on. Um, but even if that is true and you have a detailed technological plan to revamp society, this is not enough at all. If it was only about that, then Mustard City would have succeeded to change the society, as it is a self-sustainable city. Same goes for kibbutz communities or other self-sustainable communities. So yeah, the Venus project um, developed some designs like how to um, develop or build a city that is very sustainable, automated, autonomous. Um, and they have the blueprints, they are arguing, they are saying, but is it put into practice? And if it was put into practice, what is Facebook doing or Meta? What is Google doing? What is Amazon doing? What is Microsoft doing? We will still have YouTube there. Will there are still be some retarded videos about um, I don't know some some Disney stories or. What about the Hollywood companies? You know, even if you have a blueprint like that, even if you have a design about a sustainable city where everything is automated and, and um, autonomous, that is not enough. And I think that some projects like these don't really understand. We have to work with the reality, with what's there, and then try to focus on a problem. That's what we are trying to uh, point towards with the Trump project. We are just arguing trade is the origin of most problems and we should work on the problem and then solutions will arrive. A city from the Venus project could be one solution to like how a sustainable city could look like. And I would love to visit that city. I would love to probably live in one of these cities. It looks very nice, but I would also love to travel, of course. So, um, yeah, the future has to evolve and it's always evolving from what we are focusing on. And when we are focusing on the problem, then we can move away from that problem. This is how we solved um, infectious diseases. We recognized the problem, we recognized these little viruses or bacteria, the microorganisms that are causing these infectious diseases and then we develop some solutions for it. We wash our hands before we do something. We can cook something in hot water before we use that tool. And that will um, destroy these microorganisms. So that's the thinking behind um, the Tron project. All right. Um, let's continue. If you're still not convinced and believe that having a mind-blowing technology, say nuclear fusion for unlimited energy, will solve something inside the trade game, then consider the following. 502,000 people die each year because of contaminated water 
and over 1.8 billion do not have access to safe water even though there are 15 dollars plastic water purification bottles for sale on amazon plus an abundance of other related technologies out there so there are so many people thinking about okay we just need nuclear fusion and that's going to solve all of our problems that we have there are people like elon the businessman musk who says well we can it's it's all gonna be fine we will have no problems the future is gonna be great we are just going to solve everything with um, electric vehicles and he is going to produce so many tesla cars but where are the resources coming from under what conditions are people producing these electric cars and is it really like that that we should move everybody that has a car right now based on fossil fuels that everybody that owns a car should have now an electric car does it make sense to me you know elon musk is just a charlatan he knows how to yeah promote himself and uh, be a, just a good businessman that's what he does if elon musk would be serious about solving today's problems then he would definitely be not the richest guy on this planet and the same goes for jeff bezos and however these billionaires are called technology is not going to solve our problems unless we change the trade game that we're playing around 9 million people die each year of hunger and more than 870 million are starving why we already have the technology and resources to fully feed them all. Heck, we could even transition to a different diet that would need little to no animal products to get rid of the huge mess that creates both environmental and health issues. But that's also not happening. Let's continue with electricity. 1.3 billion of us are still without access to electricity and 2.6 billion people on this planet are without cleaning cooking facilities and here you can just see pictures of yeah the the crazy realities of like las vegas and probably a city in africa where people not even have cooking facilities also with internet we could of course provide everybody here on this planet with internet um, for free or very close to it and then also life expectancy like science and technology have made it possible for humans to live well into their 80s or 90s today but worldwide life expectancy averages are around 67 years because so many still do not have access to these treatments and die in their 50s or 60s and even younger. Even more dramatic is that some 27 million people on top of what we've presented so far die each year from preventable causes like things that are solvable with today's science and technology like for example infectious diseases, smoking, alcohol, obesity, medical errors, traffic collisions and so on. From workplace accidents to not having access to basic healthcare like vaccines also so insane i've read that like the world produced 11 billion doses of vaccines but in some countries or some parts of the world people don't have access to that and like what the fuck if we have enough for everybody why don't we just give it to them of course, there's the incentive to make a profit out of that for pharmaceutical companies. And then that's just what they do. Then the direct and indirect influence of tobacco, alcohol and other toxins are being killed by other people, even committing suicide. All situations that are direct effect of the trade game, poor food products, education, negligence, not enough money and so on. And combined with those who die from starvation, it's the yearly equivalent of the entire population of Canada. Some 36 million people dying from preventable causes. And this is only a rough estimation as the actual figures may be much higher. Keep in mind that these are parents, brothers and sisters, grandparents, people with dreams and ideas, unique creatures with great potential that will never again exist in the entire universe. 
and the counts above are only of the people who are dying. The amount of preventable suffering experienced by those who survive these situations is countless. There are already many more empty apartments than homeless people, more cars than people can drive, more clothes than people can wear, more gadgets than people can use, and yet so many people lack access to those things. There are technological solutions and scientific knowledge to fix most issues today, from global warming to diseases, from accidents to crimes and all kinds of other threats, but is it happening? I think it is naive to think that the electric car cheers Elon Musk or a nuclear fusion reactor or cheaper solar panels or whatever other magic technology we can point at can fix the world's issues. If it were like that, the above issues would have been solved already. Well then, another myth about technology is that automation will replace most of the jobs and therefore will force this trade game to change. Is it true? Because people will come up with all kinds of different bullshit jobs. There's actually David Graeber and that guy wrote a whole book about that. He was an um, economist and he wrote that book Bullshit Jobs. <laughs> and in today's world there are so many people that are working in a bullshit job where they do unnecessary, boring, monotonous things that are irrelevant. Think about here um, jobs like uh, social media managers, online advertisers, app developers, interior designers, fashion critiques, internet stars like YouTubers, all sorts of startups and all sorts of new and non-automatable jobs non-automatable because of their subjective nature, they will always be invented and um, pushed forward by this trade game to keep this endless, mindless trading going on. Um, so yeah, we should be aware of that new jobs, no matter how pointless or silly or just for the sake of employing people are, they will always be invented. And then there are even studies that argue that technology in fact creates more jobs. So we should also keep that in mind. Um, yeah, we should also add the fact that all kinds of tribe rules are used to slow down automation. You know, just think about a restaurant. Pretty much everything could be automated there. There are many tribes that do not finance many projects if they do not employ a certain number of people, despite them being able to do the job better with machines instead of people. And then there's also a financial cost to automate many jobs that can be automated. Then there are companies who still use Windows 7 or Windows XP and just think about if they cannot like keep their software updated, how can they automate their business? So just look around, there are so many jobs that could be automated today. Some could have been automated some hundred years ago, but are they? And another thing would be the UBI, the Universal Basic Income. It has is also a lot of discussion going on, um, of course, like should we give people a Universal Basic Income that they have a income and just can um, work additionally? But then, um, yeah, so in theory, such a payment would help so many people, including um, like open source developers, people who volunteer, people who help other people. Um, and let's say that experimental studies show that people become more kind with each other when they are given this unconditional payment and they spend more time on education, helping the community, etc. So let's suppose all that. But then, can we really expect that this will be implemented quickly enough or in that perfect state across all tribes? I just think about in Ukraine and in Russia, like the war that's going on, will you like people from the Ukraine and Russia get the UBI as well? Um, it would probably be, be good, so the Russians won't be forced to go into that war anymore. But of course it's different because, you know, there are different mechanisms. Vladimir Putin is trying to 
keep this war going on as long as he can probably because he's crazy um, so and wants to hold on to his power so it's tricky but let's get back to the UBI wouldn't all kinds of rules be applied such as you have to be a natural citizen of this tribe or never leave the tribe in order to get it then what about wouldn't this privatize all state-run services like healthcare like um, if you want to go to the doctor you would have to pay it because it's privatized if everything is privatized we can experience how it is in today's world like everything costs in the US if you break your leg people don't want to go into the hospital anymore because they cannot pay the bill um, so yeah that's also fucked up because there's the profit based schemes there then what about wars yeah that's what I was talking about corruption inequality how does this approach address any of that will this incentivize even more competition between companies as they would then gain new customers and therefore more profits to fight for more production to manage and produce more waste what about this endless consumption of people that are consuming year by year fashion things like clothes or whatever things that they don't really need because just to keep the cyclical consumption going on so it's very tricky and these answers are also tricky and you could also think about the game monopoly and then there is one winner in the end the the the, the guy who has the monopoly and the, who has who owns all the streets all the hotels and everything and he is just giving a ubi so there would still be like he would still be the richest player in the game and the other ones would be still pretty much very poor but um yeah that's also a, a, a image that comes into my mind so yeah also Tio was living on a sort of ubi uh, on some donations but it's very difficult very tricky to maintain um, uh, a living on this planet to yeah because you're also just going to live on the basics so to put this simply even with the ubi in effect people will still be persuaded by advertising to flock to buy the latest smartphone and their ubi won't be enough to afford it so they will still seek for jobs that will be increasingly scarce due to automation to cover for such juicy ones for example apple they are going to push every year another iphone people will be advertised people want to have that latest iphone and we have more consumption going on people will still feel the need to take out expensive loans companies will still seek to maximize profit exploitation of people and the environment and things may even get worse than before even within the best case scenario where this ubi indeed covers people's needs many people would have more money extra earnings from different kinds of other jobs to consume even more and perpetuate the trade game much longer than it could last otherwise so take this into account that's why i'm also critical about the ubi and um yeah always skeptical um abundance alone is not enough yeah this one is also about a great uh, marketing scheme of companies you know you can usually have tap water for how much like two cents or even less per liter but companies and that's what i'm actually drinking i'm only drinking um tap water but companies they are selling um uh, bottled water and they are making a lot of profits out of that so even though we have an abundance even though like there's so much tap water um like the trade game finds way of making money out of that abundance 
So that's the point here basically. The entire digital world is one of abundance because everything in that world is nothing more than collections of zeros and ones. A movie in digital form costs near nothing to replicate it billions of times, yet you are restricted from doing that and you still have to pay in order to access most digital stuff. Just think about the, how are they called, the paywalls. Um, behind articles, behind studies, behind uh, movies, behind documentaries. But um, yeah, it's mind boggling to consider how much online stuff is currently being protected behind paywalls. Therefore, even when the means of production and distribution are near zero marginal costs, there are still many ways to make a highly profitable business out of such things. So don't expect that the zero marginal cost idea, abundance, will make things free or significantly change society. Just look, at, just look to the internet where so many businesses thrive by selling zeros and ones. Or in other words, selling abundance. So... Yeah, uh, here it's about Facebook creates nothing, yet it is the largest social network uh, nowadays called Meta. Um, as a search engine, Google creates nothing, yet it is the most profitable search engine and business in the world. Amazon hardly sells anything of its own. Okay, nowadays it does more and more. Yet it's the biggest retailer. Airbnb is perhaps the largest apartment rental service in the world but owns no apartments and in the real world uber is the largest taxi service out there while owning no vehicles showing again that although anyone could have designed a system like uber for free where anyone could respond to ride requests and make a few bucks without owing uber anything but that didn't happen either so it has made a very profitable service out of that something that is so abundant, drivers. So, and this is the sharing economy that so many people are talking about. You know, Airbnb owns no apartment, but it is so profitable. And that's why you can see making a profit from abundance is something that is already happening in abundance today. Another great point. So now I think we covered some really important points in this video already, like how technology and science is not going to be a savior. Um, it's always about the bigger picture, the bigger structural um, structure that we're in and how technology is being used there. Um, now we are going to have two or three more points in this video and the first one is protests, revolts and good people may mean nothing. I won't go into that now um, because I would say you can just read about that. But the main, the main story is here that in 1989 in Romania millions of people went on the streets for a revolution, they were throwing over the government, they were killing uh, the dictator and his wife and were celebrating that, they were so excited, now we are going to have it better, uh, we are going to be united, the world is going to be better now. Um, but what happened is with the new government it got worse, like the people had a uh, had it harder, it was more difficult and um, yeah, the main point we should get from this is that um, yeah, revolutions and protests may change nothing in the end. The same, we can see the same thing um, happening throughout history and all over the world like Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Jesus and so many others marched and suffered for trying to urge for peace and a good society that cares for all equally. More and more inspirational videos with many millions of views and image memes asking for peace on earth and equality all spread on social networks like viruses. Maybe you've also seen so many inspirational videos for example. So many try to scream out loud that we need to create a better world, pointing toward the problems of today. Like think about Fridays for Future, the climate is changing, we need to tackle climate change and all that. 
Yes, but what is the underlying problem of climate change? That is our trade-based society. Um, yet, as far as I can tell, there is almost no impact globally. Just look around the world and we still see everywhere these huge inequalities, disparity, hunger, or hungry and angry people, exploitation of people and the environment, corruption, major abuses of power and so on, despite all of these people with good intentions. Plus, just because so many people are screaming about something does not mean it is a good thing. If you scream to ban GMO, genetically modified organisms, and you know very little or nothing about the subject and its implications, or you have been led to believe a lot of misinformation, success with your protest may only mean a halt for the progress of science and technology. Instead of spending the energy screaming out loud about the problems of today and demanding solutions from nowhere, basically, Maybe it is far better idea to spend that energy deeply learning about and understanding the issues at hand and working toward um, legitimate solutions or else history will repeat itself over and over and over again, spinning the same wheel, um, eliminating leaders and replacing them with others and never solving anything. And the other point, um, which is one of the last points of this chapter, is the illusion of building a new society. It is not going to happen from one day to the other. I'm not suddenly 40, 50 or 60, I'm becoming older, day by day. And that's the thing with a new society, with a different society. Um, it's not going to happen in 2072, but it is more a process. Um, and that's the point here. We will not suddenly feel our knees become rusty, our skin become dry or develop blurry vision, but it will instead build up gradually becoming part of who we are. The same, but as part of a saner, never sane society. We will become part of it as time progresses, changing our values, customs, rituals, ideas. And this society will continually improve but never arrive at some imagined final stage. Yeah, think about a movie. Like this example is when a movie ends right after the two romantic lovers get together. What happens after that? Do they get into fights? Maybe break up? How much will their love diminish over time? Will they become a boring and uninterested couple? Or how about a movie about a utopian city? I want to know what happens after everything is okay at the end of the film. Will that society eventually break up? Will new problems arise and so on? The ways that most movies end are representations of human imaginations that give a false sense of reality. And because of such notions, many may expect for a sane society to put into practice as if it's a movie and might expect for it to happen on the 23rd of January 2070 or something like that. We need to get used to the idea that we will all grow right alongside such a society, never arriving, never reaching an end, but instead evolve along with it. So don't expect it because it will never pop into existence. And this is, yeah, also such an important point because you might also think well, the world is so fucked, okay, the saner, I cannot see a saner society emerging, so I'm not doing something anymore. I'm just, I'm not caring anymore. But then I'd say, well, of course, like, you should not expect this saner society where you have trade-free access to basically everything what you need and want. It's also not going to be possible for everybody on this planet to have a golden elephant. So the point here is also, you know, our values, our customs, our rituals, our behaviors, they need to grow alongside this saner society. I don't want to have a, a, a Porsche. I don't want to have a, a, the latest iPhone. I don't want to have a huge mansion. I just want to have some basic, uh, basic living standard and then I'm happy. And I would just like to have free time to learn about this world 
to work on some projects like the trade free um, directory to continue to make these videos and then I would say I just have a, a, a great life and, and then that's it. And with Linux and open source and free software I can I can have joy in, in, in playing around with it, in learning how it works, in helping some projects here and there. And I might learn more about the human body and how to um, treat illnesses like or, or walk in a hospital and there help other people. So it's more it's 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 a kind of thinking, it's a train of thought, it's a it's a way to think about the world. It's not to not care about the world. It's not to just live an egoistic life where you, where you don't give a shit about anything anymore. It's not about um, completely egolessness. Like if you if you forget to also enjoy life, to to live a good life for yourself. Um, it's a balance, you know. Uh, yesterday I was wakeboarding and I just had a, a, I had a blast. It was so cool to to just go wakeboarding, have fun, enjoy that, and um, move my body. And I also like to go out to go inline skating and hiking and um, swimming and do so many different things, getting to meet people. Um, but I have this thinking in my mind. I know where the problems are coming from. It's always gonna be trade that is corrupting things, that is causing problems to arise. So I'm trying to avoid trade. I'm trying to work in this trade-free direction. But I'm not... I'm also living my own life in a way. And I think that's probably... Yeah, the, the, the best that you can do in today's world because it's very tricky. I also need some money to sustain myself, to live in this world. Um, but I can save some food with food sharing and yeah, just try my best. And if each and every one of us would just um, walk a bit in this direction, then we um, would help each other more and more. And this is also the end of the second chapter now. The third um, chapter is beyond the game. So, how can we organize and really get an idea how a, how a trade-free world or one where trade is, a, is obsolete or a thing of the past could look like? How are we going to um, satisfy the needs and wishes of people? Uh, what about opportunities and progress? This is going to be um, exemplified and showcased with many examples from today's world. And we can learn so much from that chapter. I think we, could, we can learn so much from the second chapter already. When I first read that book, I was like, the first chapter, okay, things are bad. And, and with the history of trade and okay, now I understand, I realize more and more. I see the, the greater perspective, um, the wider picture um, that we are living in. Uh, the second chapter about different ideas, fascism, um, authoritarianism, totalitarianism, capitalism, free market, democracy, socialism, communism. Technocracy was interesting and then sharing a gift economy, open source, decentralized. So we have some, we have some amazing projects, some, some great approaches in this world and we should shift our energy more towards these approaches instead of the profit motive of today's trade game. And this is going to be the, the challenge um, of this century. The problems are pushing um, and yeah, it's going to be tricky. Um, but yeah, as I said, we, can, we, can all, we are also just individuals. So yeah, um, I'm just going to, to keep pushing this direction forward and um, let's see what happens let's see where this path continues 
Um, is there anything more than I want to say? Maybe, yeah, of course, like our projects, you can see the directory um, growing. We keep adding some goods and services here and there. I would like to point out to trom.tf our trade-free services that are also um, improved and being maintained on a daily basis. We have we are offering a social network, a file sharing, a Nextcloud instance, a PeerTube instance, where you could also watch that video. We have a messenger office application, uh, video conference, everything is trade free, no trackers, no ads, no premium functions that you have to pay for. Everything is just trade free. And um, we are working on the Trom 2 documentary. Um, it would just be amazing if you could um, help to, to finish this documentary. I mean, we have all the recordings and um, Theo is working on it like crazy but unfortunately since the donations um, got less and less um, he also needs to find a way in this trade-based society to make a living somehow so that also takes some time so we would just appreciate any um, help be it financially be it um, telling other people about the Tron project about what it is about um, I think we can all learn so much from it and uh, work towards a saner society all right with these last words I'm just gonna say I look forward to the next video see you then take care and much love Thank you.